Greetings, salutations, and welcome to Sports Lick, the sports television program for the high plains of West Texas and eastern New Mexico. I'm your host, Doc Elder, and a special episode tonight. We're getting a male and a female look at Greyhound football. We'll have a high school highlight segment. We'll have overtime. But as always, I'll start out with an Eastern recap. The Color Purple may have been a great movie and a great book, but it's kryptonite for the Zia volleyball team, apparently, as they lose to purple-clad Texans from Tarleton State and New Mexico Highlands. Greyhound soccer team came really close to sweeping the week series against Midwestern State. They didn't. They lost 1-0. And speaking of close, the Zias came that close, well, maybe that close, to getting a goal that would have gotten them the conference championship against the visitors from Texas A&M Commerce. They didn't get that goal. They end up with the third seed, but they go to the playoffs anyway. Well, that's our Eastern recap, so we're going to clear the set, and I'm going to bring in my first guest right now. Welcome back to Sports Look, and we get great pleasure in bringing back to Sports Look a gentleman we've had on before in previous years, the offensive coordinator for Greyhound Football, Kelly Lee. And Coach, welcome back to Sports Look. Thank you. It's always great to be here. Coach, uh, there's a lot of talk today in America about BOGO, buy one, get one. Well, you guys won one, and you got two. By right. winning on Saturday, you guaranteed yourselves two more home games this season. Yeah, it's exciting, especially late in the year, to have opportunity to, to plant your feet in the ground and play at home for two weeks, and we're really excited about that. So the game was cool from that standpoint, but it was even cooler because a little thing called the wagon wheel was on the line. Yeah, it's you know small school, Division two level. These rivalries are really what it's all about, and you know we take a lot of pride in that. And having won it last year, we wanted to fight hard to defend it. And, of course, a lot of guys – from our squad are from around this part of the world. They know how much bragging rights in this part of the world means. So it was more than just kind of, oh, yeah, Absolutely. it'd be nice. Yeah. It, it was yeah. real. Yeah, it helps during recruiting, too, when you go <laughs> to schools. Uh, everyone knows about the rivalry, and it's going to be talked about. So It had been a long time, Kelly, since the Greyhound football team had won back-to-back -back wagon wheels, but uh, you guys rewrote the history books for the first time since 2001-2002. You guys did it in back-to-back -back years. Right, right. And that is a testament to the kids. They just played um, with great effort and uh, poise and their determination. Did you sense a different atmosphere in the week of practice in the locker room? Or are you kids pretty much just take care of business and the team? You know, uh, this group has really practiced well all year. Um, and I think they prepared um, like they have. Unfortunately, there's been times where we just haven't, performed on all all uh, cylinders and I think finally you know this time it, it hit and really all three phases were clicking and the kids you could kind of sense a little change a little difference in pregame warning they were really locked in so. and I've had the pleasure of broadcasting all of your games this year and I can say from my vantage point in the press box this was the most complete game you guys have played oh by far I think and you know since since our staff's been here it probably you know we've had some really great wins but I think it just all three phases playing well together and never never batting an eye. It was probably our best win up to this point. One thing that did surprise me was the fact that normally I see you guys come out and run what we call the bone formation, where your sure. backs line up slightly outside the offensive tackles. You've got a fullback. You were running what I like to call the half bone, where you have one back where you would expect and one fullback, sure. but the other back is more like a, a flanker. And was there a specific reason why you went with that formation? Well, we were just trying to try to outflake the defense on the perimeter a little bit, um, um, trying to get them to move people, um, set them by formation-wise a little bit, just to you know put our guys in the best situation possible. It was with a little bit of trepidation that I saw the forecast for Saturday night. Uh, you would see, hear the expression, fair weather fans. Well, there yeah. are fair weather fans that if the temperature dips below a sure. certain point, they're not going to come out. Yeah. If it's windy, they're not going to come out. You would have thought it was 75 degrees and sunny because the stands were filled for that. Game. Yeah, and they were no, they were loud. It was, it was cranking, so it was, it was great to have those people out there supporting us. 
I imagine a little bit of heart palpitation on the sideline with the opening kickoff when uh, the ball kind of didn't get fielded by your return it, team. It was, especially, I mean, that was the whole point of emphasis. I, I'm, I'm upstairs, but I heard Coach Lynn right before he got them all together. He said, it's going to be windy. It's going to hang up. Everyone move up. Just make sure we filled it. If we filled it, we're going to get good field position. The return, anything else is just gravy. Then it goes out there and bounces and bounces this way. And, Oh, it kind of reminded you of that commerce game a little bit. So it did indeed. Uh, but exactly. the defense came out. You know, um, they had a bad snap, pushed them back, got the ball right back, and then we had the great drive to start the game. Coach, we don't need to just speculate about how good a game it was. We actually have visual proof. Right. Our highlight crew went out and got you some visuals. So let's cue up the highlight That's reel, good. and why don't you walk us through it? Sure. Well, they got the 4-H uh, bringing in the wagon wheel there. And and luckily, uh, we'll get to bring it in again next year. Let's we'll see what we have cooked up for that. Uh, we honored our seniors last uh, regular season home game, and that was them. Great bunch. Uh, this is a midline play. Uh, Jeremy Burma read it right. We've been, Elon had been carrying it and kind of folded him there and got in that touch uh, for the first score. Uh, second one was actually a play called to Elon, but uh, Burma did a heads up thing, saw they vacated A gap and just took it in himself. Real smart play. I think this is the, play, yeah, yeah, Seth Bailey right there coming in and stripping the ball. And, and that really gave us a short field and opportunity to go three scores early. And, and uh, their defense had been on the field a long time, put them right back on. And it was a couple plays later, Elon was able to take it in there. That's amazing how you can just see the hole open up there. Great job, yeah, the camera. It was board. great blocking and uh, well executed. Um, free safety had been running the alley hard, so we took advantage of it. We got Jordan up the scene one time there for for a big play. I think it might have been our second pass of the game. We hadn't thrown much at that point. This was a big play because I think this uh, answered one of their, they had scored their first touchdown. So uh, Tucker there got a, got one back across the grain and, and made a good play. We gave him a little, um, teased him a little about the kicker making a tackle on him, but that was a great tackle. And he had that big one against him last year. So yeah. And then this one kind of sealed the deal. Jeremy did a good job firm stepping up in the pocket, finding Jacob back at end zone for a great catch. Both of guys made super plays yeah. on that. And another uh, Ibrahim Maiga coming in there and really shutting down that screenplay they tried to run all night. Elliot Peters forcing the quarterback, trying to find his drag, and Julian Underwood comes comes up for the pick and, and you know, that kind of put put them in a bad situation as far as having to rush the rest of the game. And then uh, we got a penalty on that drive and couldn't uh, uh, get a touchdown in, but Mitchell Cox kicked a nice 40-yarder. And that was just a play where, uh, you know, we've been running up inside. It was a third and one, and uh, we called Jeremy on a keeper, and he did some nice um, ball handling skills there and uh, sealed the game, and we were able to sing that fight song and run up the hill. We had a lot of alumni and, and uh, some fraternity kids in there and, and former players, so it was a good time there to sing the fight song and celebrate. And Coach? That is, unless something catastrophic happens to our plans, that's the last time that the wagon wheel will be on that burn. Right, because right. by the time we host again, we'll have a brand new facility. Yeah, and we talked about that. That it makes it a little bit more special. The last time it was played in Blackwater Draw, and we kept it at home where it belongs. What did you say to the kids at halftime? We were speculating. I actually had one of your former players, Malcolm Butter, is doing color commentary right. for me. And I was saying... What do you think Coach Lynn is saying? Is, is he saying we got to treat the second half just like with 0-0? Zero, zero, or, okay, we've got a 21-point lead. Let's just not do anything stupid. I, you know, you talk about you got to play like it's 0-0, zero, zero, but we kind of went over, you know, we're going to force them to have the win in the third quarter. We need to keep the pressure on them. You know, we'll, we'll be aggressive in the third quarter. We can keep our lead. And then in the fourth quarter, you know, when they get the win, you know, we'll uh, really try to run the clock then. So. You know, it was the idea to go out and be aggressive in the third quarter, hold on to that lead, and then just be able to, you know, sit sit on it and make sure that we come away with that wagon wheel in the fourth quarter. And, Coach, it would have been an important game anyway because it's the wagon wheel. Right. It's our bitter arch rivals. It's for bragging rights in this part of the world. But it turned out that that game actually was more meaningful because it was also playing for who was going to get the fifth seed and guaranteed right. two home games. Yeah. So the, if, we, if we hadn't won that game, we'd had to go on the road. Um, the second playoff opportunity. So this gave us two home games, and that's great to be here, you know, with our home crowd and everybody's family can come to the games next to. And we'll be able to send our seniors out their last time at home. So that it was awesome to be able to, to achieve that.
No question about it. Well, we thought we were going to be playing McMurray this coming Saturday, two sure. days hence, but it turns out we're actually going to get a return engagement with the Javelinas of Kingsville. And I'm here to tell you, they're a better team than they were when we beat them 31 to nothing. They are, and they, you know, they went ahead and made a coaching change, and and it's since that point they've uh, they've really been playing hard, um, you know, and, and probably uh, just a little bit of a change brought a new atmosphere, and and uh, you know, defensively they for a team that's one and eight, they've been pretty solid all year, but early in the year their offense was putting them in a lot of bad situations, and uh, now the offense is playing a lot better, and and so that you know, kind of shines, shows that their defense isn't bad. Now the offense can move the ball. So they're a dangerous team. And, you know, they have a lot of history and tradition, and they don't want to be last in the conference. So they're going to come up here with a chip on their shoulder. we got to be ready to play. I think you will. Well, Coach Kelly Lee, thanks so much for being my guest, and uh, best of luck against the Hobblinas. Thank you. Appreciate it, Doc. All right. Well, that is going to wrap up our first interview segment. As always, we're going to clear the sets, and we'll queue up the high school segment right now. Welcome into High School Spotlight. I'm Josh Bellin Gallagher. That's Ian Forsyth. I have a mustache because it is November. November means two things raising awareness for men's health and also New Mexico high school football playoffs. And brackets coming out across the state in about 72 hours, a little bit less than that. So we got tons of action coming up. Ian? We had a great 5A district matchup this past weekend. Let's watch it. In what was dubbed the High Plains Game of the Year by critics all across our production staff, the 5A number two Artesia Bulldogs clashed with district rival the number three Goddard Rockets last Halloween night. Artesia making a record third appearance on High School Spotlight this year. First quarter we pick it up and Artesia runs into a little trouble. Quarterback Justin Hotling is picked off by Goddard's Dean McDaniel who returns it into Bulldog territory. On the ensuing drive, quarterback Cameron Neff bounces to the outside and finds a promised land, Goddard up seven to nothing. Cameron Neff should have stuck with his legs this game instead of throwing the two interceptions. And one of them here, Ian. Goddard got the ball back, but not for long. Neff's pass goes through the hands of Ricky Roybal and into the hands of Joey Lopez for Artesia. And just like Goddard's interception turned to points, so does Artesia's. Very next play, hotling to Travis Wilkinson, and after some great blocking downfield, he is in for six. Artesia ties it at seven. Second half still tied at seven, but tied no more. Third quarter, Hotling rifles it into Ben Kelly, and the Bulldogs are on top 14 to seven. In the fourth we go, Goddard needs a score and check out the effort from Neff here. Dodger tacklers weaving in and out, but no happy ending here. Jonah Reza, now you see him, now you don't. Play spoiler with the INT for Artesia. Interceptions left and right kept the fans alert in this exciting game, Josh. Artesia now in control late and looking to ice it away, but oh no, Hotling here, picked off by Adam Gomez, and he's taking matters into his own hands. A pick six and Goddard is back in it, but after a missed PAT, they still trail 14 to 13. But Artesia's drive after the Goddard score was picture perfect, eating up the clock and moving the chains. Andy Azua out of the slot and down the field for 18. That catch and run sets up this. Hotling to Ben Kelly in the back of the end zone. Artesia up 20 to 13 with under a minute left. Goddard has one last chance for midfield, down by seven, and do we have a miracle in our midst? Dean McDaniel running around, staying on his feet, and he's going to make things awfully interesting, but in the end, it just racks up a few yards on the stat sheet. McDaniel is eventually brought down, and Coach Cooper Henderson on the Artesia Bulldogs march into the Bulls' Bowl, Bowl and defeat the Goddard Rockets 20-13. We're going to move on to rankings, starting with the big 6A class. In one, we have Rio Rancho, Mayfield at two, El Dorado at three, Cleveland at four, La Cueva and Las Cruces swap spots after Las Cruces loses to Oñate, five and six respectively, and Clovis rounding out the top ten. In 5A, we have a new number one, and it is those Artesia Bulldogs. After their win over Goddard 20-13, they move up to number one as they replace Centennial, who was upset by Belen in a thriller 38-35. Belen after the win, they jump up to three, and Goddard after the loss, they move down to four. Mayamura is at five after they beat Farmington, and Lovington still in the top ten, although they did get upset by Roswell 28 to 14. We're going to move on down to 4A if that's okay with you. Robertson at one with a 9-0 record. Riadoso at two, St. Mike's at three, Cobre at four, and Portales moves up to five after their huge upset over St. Mike's 33 to 20. New Mexico Military Institute drops down to nine despite shutting out Hope Christian this past weekend. 
in 3A. Clayton coming off a of bye and still number one, but they are followed at two by a new team, the Dexter Demons, after they defeated Loving 54 to nothing. Lordsburg follows at three. Estancia is at four, Laguna Acoma is at five, Santa Rosa is in at seven, Eunice at eight, and Texaco down at nine. The 2A brackets have been released, and here are the results. Escalante got the one seed, and they'll face Cuesta, the four seed, Friday night at seven in Escalante. Hagerman at number two seed and Fort Sumner at three will face each other Friday at six in Hagerman. And also the eight-man brackets unveiled this week. Logan, the number one seed, no surprise there as they're unbeaten on the season. They will play the eight Jemez Valley tomorrow night at seven. On that same side of the bracket, Gateway Christian, they're the defending champs, but they're going to have a new task to tackle as they come in as the four seed. Coach Sean Wigley and the boys will face a familiar foe as they face Foothill, the number five seed, which is a rematch of last year's state championship game. On the other, other side of the bracket, Melrose gets the three seed. They will play Tatum. Magdalena has the two, and they will play Dora slash Elida Saturday at 1 o'clock. And in six-man, we had some results in the new bracket. The four seed, San Juan slash Grady, defeats Ani Moss 61 to 41, where they will now advance to the semifinals to take on the number one seeded Hondo Eagles. Hondo won the regular season matchup. And on the other side of the bracket, the defending champs, Lake Arthur, they defeat Vaughn 56 to six, and will go on to play Floyd in the semifinals. Let's hope this matchup is as good as the regular season one, where Floyd won 36 to 34. Those two winners will advance to the six-man state championship game. A lot of great upcoming games this weekend, so let's break them down. In 6A, we have the Hobbs Eagles taking on the Clovis Wildcats in Leon Williams Stadium. Uh, both teams looking to improve their record to 500. This game will be tomorrow night at seven. In 4A, the Portales Rams coming off a huge win over St. Mike's. They look to boost their playoff resume as they will take on the Nimi Cole, who, despite a 7-2 record, have slipped in the eyes of voters. That game in Roswell tomorrow night at 7. Another 4A matchup between the number two Rio Dosa Warriors and the number three St. Michael's Horsemen will be tomorrow night at 7 in Santa Fe. In 3A, a battle for District 4 supremacy. The Dexter Demons will come in with a number two state ranking and they will take on the Eunice Cardinals who come in with a five game winning streak. So something's got to give in Eunice tomorrow night at seven. With brackets being released across the state on Sunday, you're definitely going to want to like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel so we can keep you covered on the New Mexico high school playoff race. And also you can listen to Ian, myself and Round Ball Rodney tomorrow morning at 8.30 on Wake Up Local Sports Talk on Houndways Portales. Thank you for all your love and support, audience. Back to you. Welcome back to Sports Lick. Thanks, as always, to Josh and Ian for that high school highlight segment. And now we get to bring a Lynn to the set but not Josh Lynn. We get to bring his better half. This is Pam Lynn. Oh, Pam. thank you. Thank Welcome you. Welcome to Sports <laughs> Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Well, Pam, you are the wife of the head man, Josh Lynn. And yes. uh, how did the two of you meet? Well, believe it or not, we met online on eHarmony. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. That is not so many cool. people know that. I'm proud to announce. Wow. <laughs> no. um, and, you know, funny story about that. He, when we first started dating, said, why don't we just kind of tell people, you know, we met through coaching because I coach as well. And I said, I don't I don't know how that will work. You know, people are probably going to ask me a lot more questions. I'm a girl. I can't get away with just a one liner. And uh, he said, no, I think it'll work. Just, you know, we'll go with that. And I thought, I don't know. And so that very week we went to a graduation party, I think, and, and we had a lot of friends there. And a wife and husband came up and said, oh, where did you guys meet? And he looked at me and I said, uh, through coaching. And so, of course, the husband talked to Josh and said, oh, well, how, where do you coach? And the wife said, what, what, what game was it? Where was it? Tell me all about it. I want details. And I finally just had to come clean. I said, hey, we met online. He's, he wants me to lie about it. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. The truth is now <laughs> the out. The truth is out. Yeah, there you go. Hard-hitting expose on yep. sports. Like, yep. my goodness. Yep. Well, Pam, so, a little backstory. Where are you from? I'm from just south of Albuquerque. I grew up in Bosque Farms, a little small town there, and I went to Las Lunas High School. So, yeah. 
And uh, obviously sports in your background, yes, uh, what, what yes, was your sir. favorite sport? I played volleyball and basketball in high school, but I went on in college and played at Hofstra University out east, and I played volleyball there. So, yeah, I'm a volleyball person. My good, yeah. from just south of Albuquerque yeah. to New York. All the way across and, the country. <laughs> so what got you back again? I came home. You know, I thought about staying there and looking for jobs and it was just too far. I think it was a great place to be at school. It was a wonderful experience, but it was too far from my roots, I think. And so coming back to New Mexico was a natural thing to be closer to my family. And so I did that and I started working in Albuquerque. I was there teaching and coaching for nine years before Josh and I met. So. Pam, did you know you always wanted to be a coach, or was it something you came to kind of later on? Yeah, I kind of came into it. You know, I knew I wanted to go into education going into college. I always thought I would do elementary ed, and then when I really started looking at it, it just didn't seem quite the right fit. And the more I got into education, I felt like being in the gym was the place to be. And so I went into physical education, and then from there, you know, it was just kind of a natural next step to coach with that. Um, and after loving volleyball so much and learning so much in college, it was just natural to want to continue to share that, you know, knowledge that I'd gained from my experience with others. And so it was really neat to be able to do that. And with PE, oftentimes you have to coach. And so it was, it was perfect for me. But. Pam, I'll ask you a question that I've asked your husband mm -hmm. on a number of occasions. What do you think is really the most important attribute of a successful coach? Oh, gosh. I know I asked the hard-hitting question, sure. That's a tough one. How did you meet, you know? I coach, know, I, uh, I know. Got more than you bargained for. I know. Gosh, the most successful attribute, I think it would have to be your relationship with the kids. Um, you know, if you can't relate to those that are following you um, and you can't be a great leader, then by nature they're not going to follow and so I think that um, Josh does a really good job with that in my opinion of course I'm a little biased but I think that's a neat thing to be able to do as a coach and that's one of the most important things um, as a coach when you step back from it like I have a little bit since Josh being in this role I've had to move away from it and it's one of the things you miss most and you don't realize what an impact you have had and how important those relationships really are until you step away from it a little bit. But when you can do that, I think it really makes you successful. Do you think that your background in coaching made it easier for you to be oh, the spouse sure. or the head coach? Yes, it really has. You know, I always say you're at the office, but I really truly know he's at the office <laughs> because it is so much time and so much effort. Um, it, it, they, they put that kind of time and effort in all the time continuously and you know you have to um, you have to just kind of bear with it because you know that that it's a difficult spot to be in and um, it takes a lot of time to do what they do and so you just have to be patient on the other end of it but yeah I think it has really helped us um, kind of grow together as a couple knowing what I know about coaching and how much time and effort you have to put into it yes What's the toughest thing about being the spouse of a head coach? Oh, the loss. The losses, <laughs> for sure. Um, <laughs> you know, you want them to win so bad, and you just, you can feel um, the emotion that they feel when they don't win, and it's I always feel and say that it's almost like a death in our family when we lose on Saturday because it takes a while to kind of mourn that loss. And in football, it's a one shot once a week, you know. In my sport, in volleyball, at least you get to have another go at it at least a day later or two days later. You don't have as much time to think about it. But when we lose on Saturday, it's really hard to recoup and get going again and make sure that you get the team up and make sure you rally with your emotions. And so that's really difficult. And you want your husband and his team, you want everybody to be so successful and you see the time and effort that they put into it and it makes it hard when they lose. But Pam, let me ask you a question. I know that some coaches really try and involve their student athletes mm -hmm. in their lives and others it's more like, no, there's your time, there's me time. How well do you know the guys on Josh's team? You know, I know them by name, I know them by sight, but um, I kind of try to take a step back. I don't really feel like it's my place to be in the locker room or to be, um, you know, there are times that I wish I knew a little bit more. Josh is very good about separating work from 
um, home and there are times I'm begging for things, you know, because he really does a good job of separating. But at this, in the same breath, I understand why he does that. And so it's kind of nice to have that too. When he comes home, he's dad and husband. And when he's away, he's coach. And so there's a lot of stuff I know I don't know about the team. Um, and some of that's probably good. I think I know a lot of the really good things. So of course, I love all those kids. And I hear him talk about all the great things. And that's a neat, neat thing to be able to enjoy that part of it well Pam it's been a pleasure having you hey, and your husband you in the community yes. you're a great asset to this part of the world mm -hmm. and uh, we wish you continued success as thank a husband you. and wife and as influences on young people well thank you well that is going to wrap up our interview segment of the program I'd like to thank Pam for being my guest we're going to clear the set and I'm going to finish up with overtime right now Two days ago, we had national elections, and that got me thinking, who is the greatest athlete politician of all time? Would you say Jim Bunning or Vinegar Ben Mizell, two great pitchers who went on into Congress? Would you say Dollar Bill Bradley, first-team All-American basketball player who was a player for the Knicks and then went on to the U.S. Senate? No, I think you'd probably have to select Gerald R. Ford. Gerald R. Ford was an All-American football player at the University of Michigan. And, of course, he went on to become President of the United States. Kind of ironic thing about Jerry Ford, though, in terms of athleticism, he was pillared mightily on Saturday Night Live by Chevy Chase. And most people picture him as being a stumbling or a bumbler. No, he was a lifestyle football player. So until LeBron James runs for president and wins, Gerald Ford, you are our greatest politician athlete. Well, that is going to wrap up overtime. That is going to wrap up an episode of Sports Look. I'd like to thank all of my guests. Great floor crew, as always, Mr. Michael, the guy that was in charge for tonight's episode. So for all those aforementioned people, this is Doc Elder saying, so long. November started early for this week.